Bueno, como podéis ver, soy española, pero me han pedido que dé la charla en inglés, así que voy a, voy a seguir las órdenes de, del equipo y me disculpo de antemano por todas las cosas que pronuncie mal, ¿vale? So, Facebook. Facebook has 2.27 billion active users today. Um, if it was a country, it would be like the biggest empire in the history. And if it had an army, it would be shit scary. And if it was like a scientific experiment, like an actual social uh, uh, investigation on, say, the nature of social interactions, it would probably be illegal. But Facebook is known of these things. Facebook is a digital advertising platform whose business model is based on the massive extraction of extremely detailed and segmented data from millions of people uh, to make predictions about their lives. So uh, what they basically do, as you know, is uh, they make algorithms, predictive algorithms, that are capable of finding us in the crowd, knowing who we are, knowing what we're thinking or how we're feeling, or maybe guessing what we're going to do, and try to persuade us to do something different. And Facebook is not even the biggest advertising platform in the world right now. Of the world's most valuable brands, of the 10 most valuable brands today, nine of them are technology companies, and at least five of them are advertising platforms that work with predictive algorithms. And these algorithms are so, so special, they are so precious, that um, there is no more than like five to seven hundred people in the world that are capable of contributing significantly to this kind of code. And uh, there is uh, not a bigger number of people that can actually have access to this code. So even we, if we had access to this code, we would not understand it. Maybe you would, but I wouldn't. <laughs> but, um, but definitely, this code is absolutely secret, which means that this kind of algorithms that have a, a major impact in millions of people every day of their life, in every aspect of their life, are totally opaque. The only way we have to kind of guess what they do, or what their intentions are, or how do they work, has been through leaks through whistleblowers or through the uh, hard <laughs> reverse engineering of uh, specific uh, uh, media labs or maybe uh, the very, very extraordinary um, uh, investigation uh, that has been going on in, uh, in a number of news outlets, outlets uh, in the last few years. So, through this kind of work, uh, what we know about these algorithms is three, three things. What we know for sure. We know they are the perfect surveillance machine. And we do know that they have been used, actually that they are being used by governments and companies and other organizations to make massive dossiers of each one of us, uh, collectively and individually. And we do know that is the perfect mass manipulation machine. And uh, the thing is, 20 years, I mean, we have had, like, you know, massive, uh, like, mass communication media before. But the thing is, 20 years ago, or 40 years ago, a demagogue would have to convince a whole nation with one single message. They would have to make one single campaign for everybody. And today, the same kind of politician is capable of whispering in the ear of different people and telling and tell each one of them what he knows they want to hear and make them all think they're listening to the same message. And this is crucial for me. Like, um, we keep talking about filter bubbles as something that we individually choose to make around ourselves, where we pick like, new sources that agree with us because it makes us feel better. And this is not the case at all. Filter bubbles are like a meteorology around us. They are something, they are what happens when uh, social platforms uh, create a, re a vision, like a, like, a, like a reality that has been specifically designed for us and make us think it is the only reality that there is. And the third thing that we know about these algorithms is that they are very addictive. And in, honestly, uh, we don't need leaks for this. Uh, we just can't put our phones down. And while I have spent the last 10 years of my life researching um, 
surveillance. And definitely the last two years of my life worrying a lot about um, uh, the, the manipulation tools, especially in the context of, of political campaigns. Today, I'm going to talk about addiction, or, um, or more specifically, I'm going to try to answer the question that the kind um, organizers of this event asked me, which is, why if we know that they are spying on us, and they are manipulating us, and God knows what more, how come we can't stop using our phones? So today I'm going to be talking about addiction, and I don't think I have ever done this before, so please be kind to me. Um, and before I start, I start talking about the phones and the applications in them, I'm going to start talking about what, um, what we have agreed um, as a society that is the most addictive design of all times. So, slot machines. Slot machine is not really the thing that comes to mind when you think about gambling. Like, you more think about people playing poker or, you know, like throwing the dice and, and you know, like sexy women around and all that. But uh, slot machines make between 80 and 95% of the profits of the gambling industry. Like, they are by far the biggest money maker in that industry. And the difference uh, between uh, that kind of gambling and the other kind of gambling is the technology. Because, and this is a very important distinction, because as all the industries that, that make big profit out of addiction, the gambling industry has been uh, paying lots of research to convince us that the addiction is always in the user, that you are an addict and then you find something to be addicted to. And they even claim that uh, if they were not gambling at the casino, they would be like, I don't know, like drinking or like, you know, having, I don't know, crack cocaine or beating their wives or something. Uh, but the truth is, these machines make people at it four times faster than pretty much anything else and, uh, in the gambling industry, obviously. And, uh, and, and there is, like according to psychiatrists, there is no such thing as an addictive personality. Like, you know, that, that kind of idea, it is an idea, it doesn't really exist, uh, it hasn't been agreed upon yet, but there is definitely such thing as an addictive design. And uh, uh, Professor Natasha Schull, which is an anthropologist that works at the Culture and Media Department at the MIT, has been studying these machines for quite a few years, and she explains that the reason, like, there is three factors that make slot machines uh, highly addictive. And they are isolation, continuation, and speed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these three. I'm going to break them down. So when you play poker, or you play uh, dice, or you go to the races and, and you bet, uh, there is a lot of people that you need to deal with. There is someone that gives you the tickets, and there is someone that you need to wait for for ending the game, and there is, there is a lot of waiting, there is a lot of like, you know, queuing, and there is a lot of contingency, like human contingency. And this is annoying, like human contingency is basically chaos, like things are not in your control. But, but when you're playing uh, with a slot machine, there is nothing between you and the game. So the game happens in a very isolated world, which, uh, which is something that gamblers find very comforting, because contingency is, very, is reduced to pretty much nothing. But there is also no interruptions. So there is continuity in the sense that nothing stops them while they are playing. They don't even have to put coins anymore because um, now all the gamblers are using cards uh, that are given by the casinos that are like the, I don't know, like the flying, the flying points card. And, uh, and of course, they have their name and their histories in it. There is, this is the big data entry for the uh, casino industry. So they don't even have to stop to like, change their coins for something else or to put the coins in the machine. Like, Everything is happening in a continuum, and of course the machine uh, never stops. The machine never stops. There are some countries where uh, casinos never stop. So some people might even spend like 48 hours on a road just playing on a machine with like, you know, special diapers and everything. So um, there is this, this uh, condition where there is also no one looking at you. Like when you're playing at the, at the roulette or you're playing like poker or you're playing any other game where there's humans around you, people will look at you. There is a social interaction, where if you spend too much time there, if you have been sitting there for 48 hours, surely someone will look at you weird. So the machines are not judgmental, they just love you, <laughs> no matter what. So um, there is the condition of 
isolation, there is this endless uh, stream of um, a stream of, uh, of, of playing, and then there's a speed, and this is probably the most important. Uh, slot machines today, like the kinds that are making that 95% profit in the industry, they are multi-line machines, and they can fit up to 1,200 games in one hour. And this is what researchers called uh, event... Um, event um, Bah, I don't remember. <laughs> so um, this is a very, very uh, event frequency. This is a very important factor because the higher the event frequency, the higher the addiction rate. Crack cocaine is very addictive because it hits you real quick and then it leaves you real quick too. So people get the high and then the next thing they know they are not high and all they want to do is get high again. So they do and the repetition of this, uh, of this uh, dopamine loop makes them addicted very, very quickly. So um, the least addictive thing in the gambling industry is the lottery. And we forget this is gambling because it's just so not addictive. Why? Because the event frequency is so low. Like, you know, you, first you have to buy the ticket, and if you've been to Doña Manolita in Puerta del Sol, you know, um, it's, it's very, very low event frequency. And that's even before you start the game. So you're queuing, and then you get your ticket, and then what do you do? You put it in your pocket, and you wait for a month. So very low event frequency. No one will ever tell you, uh, I'm addicted to the lottery. Nobody is. And uh, so um, all these conditions, uh, isolation, uh, it sounds like what, what a sect that to, that's to you, you know? Isolation, continuity, and speed, like very, very high event frequency, are the three factors that make these machines very, very addictive. And now we're going to talk about phones. So uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when the, when the first uh, like popular smartphone came out, the iPhone, uh, we used to use these phones for... Uh, for what? For like when you don't know something, you don't know a word, you don't know where a street is, you don't know where something is, and you use it, but you start using it for like when you're bored, when you're waiting for the bus, you're waiting for the train, you're at the, uh, at the doctor, uh, you're whatever, you're waiting for something, so you're bored, you go to the, like you kind of like use it in times where you would be reading a book before, I guess. And then also the times where you feel a bit awkward, like for instance, uh, you're waiting for your date and the date is not here, and you don't want to look like an idiot waiting for your date. Uh, you don't want to look like something that has been uh, made waiting for a date. Or um, you arrive at a party and you don't see anyone, and what you used to do before would be talking to strangers. But now you don't do that, yuck, because contingency. So, um, so now we are using the phones more and more uh, in the, say, stretches of time that define what we are as people. Uh, and what I mean is, there is the time when you're sleeping, and there is the time when you're working, and when you're going to work and you're coming back from work. And then there is the time that um, this uh, strange chart calls survival, which is, I have read, when you're showering and like, brushing your teeth and like, shopping for, for uh, groceries and stuff. And then there is the personal time, which is the time that you choose to do the things that you love or be with the people you love. And the thing is, like, apparently, smartphones have been colonizing more and more of that time to the point that now one of the most common things that you see in the world is couples or families or, or like, you know, friends sitting quietly together looking at their phones while enjoying an um, individual dinner all together in the same place. And uh, this is making people, apparently, according to uh, specialists, very, very lonely and very sad. Actually, uh, England uh, even has a ministry of loneliness right now because of this kind of thing. And um, so there's isolation, and then there's continuity, though uh, continuity in the world of applications is called infinite scroll. So we used to have pages, right? And series used to be like, you know, you would watch something on Thursday and then you would wait for a week. Or even films were like too long for us, you know, like when films were like two hours long, Jesus Christ. And now we are somehow showered with content that never stops, that it doesn't start anywhere and it doesn't stop anywhere. And we humans are not very good at dealing with abundance. 
Like we are hardwired to deal with a scarcity, which is a problem. But abundance, we suck at it. And in the time where we've been told that content and information are like the most valuable things that there are, we just, you know, gobble whatever uh, we have. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, you know, free time and uh, things like Netflix, like platforms like Netflix have been saying that they used to compete with YouTube that had the infinite scroll but for media. And now they are, in, they are competing with you sleep. This is what the CEO of Netflix said two years ago. They said, we're not competing with all the other guys, we're competing with sleep. Which means that they are competing with the one thing apart from eating and drinking water that keeps you alive. <laughs> and talking about YouTube, which has started like the arms race of like, not sleeping, uh, there is something very peculiar about the, uh, the uh, algorithm that picks the next video for you. And in the last two years, researchers have been, uh, you know, reverse engineering, the, tr trying to reverse engineer that algorithm to see what kind of decisions it makes. And they have come to the conclusion that the, the sauce, the special thing that it does to you to keep you on, is uh, give you something of what you're already having, but a little bit more extreme. So as uh, Sineb Tufekci was saying in a very, very uh, amazing tech talk that I highly recommend two years ago, uh, if you're watching uh, a vegetarian cook, uh, YouTube would take you to the vegan cooks. And if you're watching like, something about running, it would take you to the marathons. And if you're watching something about like, environment uh, stuff, it will take you to the eco-terrorists. And if you're watching, you're following some uh, political campaigns on YouTube, which is apparently a very popular platform for that. Um, if you're following, like, say, uh, someone that is like, center-right, you end up with a Ku Klux Klan, which makes the algorithm accidentally uh, you know, political in a very dangerous and polarizing way. You just never hardcore enough for YouTube because, you know, on top of that, there is like the continuity, so it's endless, like God knows where it would take you. And this reminds me a lot of, uh, of this peculiar thing from another industry that makes a lot of money out of addiction, which is the food industry. So, as, as I said before, uh, we're not very good at uh, dealing with abundance, and, uh, and until like, not so long ago, we would be finding food uh, you know, around and we would eat it because we wouldn't know uh, how long it would, you know, would take for us to find other food. But then our brain would reward us for some things and not for others. Why? Because our brain loves sweet things. Like Sweet things are the things that we like the most. Because if, something, if you pick something and you eat it and it's uh, bitter, uh, in nature, most poisonous things for us are bitter, so we don't like that. And if we eat something that is sour, it probably indicates that the thing we're eating is rotten, it's off. But if we eat something sweet, it indicates the presence of carbohydrates, which is the main source of energy for human beings. So sugar makes our brain happy, it gives us dopamine. And so um, the food industry after the Second World War started studying what would make us the happiest uh, to compete with, you know, the brands and stuff? And they came to the conclusion that uh, there was a combination. Well, they came like a marketeer called Howard Har Horovich, uh, that had a degree in biochemistry. Apparently, he came to the conclusion that there is this point called the bliss point, that is a combination of sugar and its two enhancers, which is fat and salt, a combination of sugar, fat, and salt, that makes you. Uh, produce, release a lot of dopamine, but it doesn't leave you satisfied because it's so, somehow like extremely tasty, but not so overwhelming that you would be satisfied. And what they did to make it even more addictive is they made it crunchy, which is something that indicates that something is fresh, and they made it in small bits, event frequency. So you would be picking things out of a bag, and each one of these things would be like a game for you. And so you would get like this dopamine, dopamine loops yet again. And also, like something that they didn't do on purpose, but it also works really well, the fact that this food doesn't actually contain any food in it. So it's not nutrition at all, which means that you keep eating and you keep being hungry because it's not feeding you like properly. 
And so this is the state where you are when you like eating and eating and you, your brain is telling you, what are you doing? You don't want any more of this. Like, you know, you're eating these like things and you, your face is full of like powders and, and you know you're being ridiculous and you just can't stop yourself. This has been designed for you. And uh, the state where you are when you're doing this is a very similar state, actually the same kind of a state that gamblers are in front of a machine. And it's called a state of flow. And flow is a state where you are like highly concentrated and you know exactly what you're going to do next, right? And you know pretty much exactly what is going to happen. So it makes you feel very good. Gamblers call it the zone. And the zone is, yeah, it's, it's just like this point that everybody's looking forward to, which m makes you feel that you're like in connection with the universe around it. And this zone is very easy to create in front of a gambling machine, in front of a slot machine, because the universe in that machine is very small. And, it, and, it, and I'm really, really amazed by this, um, by this kind of thing, because it hacks something that makes you happy, which is the... the the possibility, no, the fact that you're learning something. So being in the zone is something that happens to surgeons when they are doing a really good job, is, is what happens to writers when they are like, you know, inspired, is what happens to people when they forget about what they are doing because they are so good at it, they can actually enjoy the ride. And this is what gamblers are looking for. And one of the things that amazed me the most about um, Professor Schull's research was that on and on again, people would tell her that, uh, that they were getting annoyed, while they were, well, they were gambling at the slot machines, that they would get annoyed when they hit a jackpot. Jackpot is the big, the big prize where you get all the money in the machine. And they would get really annoyed when they hit one because that kicked them out of the zone. Because, you know, the whole thing would stop and there would be a lot of noise and people would, like, comp them, like, like, you know, congratulate them and they would be really pissed off because all they want to do is to be in the zone. So everything in the machine is designed to put you on the zone. And in the zone, you lose your sense of time, you lose your sense of body, you lose your sense of, of money, of spend. You lose everything, like everything around you disappears and you're in like this floating, uh, kind of like, you know, on, the, on top of the wave. So the machines are designed to give you this, and the one element that, I, that is my favorite and the design for uh, putting you into the zone is the handle. The handle that you pull, when the uh, original machines came out, um, they were called one-arm bandits, um, the, 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 the handle and the reels would be connected because they were mechanical and they would be like a certain connection in the way you would like, you know, pull faster or slower, like, you know, you, you, would have, um, you would have an input in the actual result, or at least uh, it made more sense that you would. But uh, new machines are very different. New machines uh, have a pull that is just there to give you the feeling of control that you can actually have an output. Uh, and it doesn't do anything else. It's like a, what they call the physical reel connected to the virtual <laughs> reel that is behind, which is basically a computer. And everything uh, is designed to give you that feeling that you are learning something. Because when you're like, you know, that you are in this communion with a machine, it just means that you can actually beat the game at its own game, because you're becoming very good at it. So that's the zone. And uh, that particular design has actually made its way into the phones. It is called pull to refresh. There is, I mean, you are coders. You know there is absolutely no reason why you would have to do this thing with the, with the phone to get the content. Like, it is totally artificial. It is as artificial as the pull from the, uh, from the actual machine. It is there to give you the illusion of control that you need in order to get into the zone, to get into that state of zombiness where you can stop eating or you can stop gambling and you have lost your sense of time. And the other thing that happens when you pull, because there is a combination of things here, is that you don't know what's coming next. I mean, you kind of know because it's your phone and you know the shape of what's coming, but you don't know what it is. You don't know if it's going to be good news or bad news or if it's going to be someone that you know, gave you a lot of likes or that someone that, uh, that said something really nasty about you in Twitter, say. You don't know what's coming next. And, uh, and this, apparently, 
uh, from behavioral science point of view, is the most addictive thing that there is. And this was something that, um, that B.F. Skinner, which is the father of uh, behavioral science, discovered by accident while trying to train his pigeons. So um, Skinner is uh, the other biggest um, uh, psychologist in the 20th century, uh, the other one being Freud, his, uh, his uh, mortal enemy forever. And, uh, and Skinner was training pigeons uh, for the army. And uh, one of the things that he discovered is that you can train a pigeon to go for food. Like, you can teach a pigeon that if you, if you pick in a hole or, at, or a rat, if you touch something, then you're going to get food. But if you give that rat or that pigeon food, uh, sometimes, and there is not an actual logical pattern uh, in these times. And the, the, the animal doesn't know uh, what, what it's going to get, if it's going to be food or not, or how much it's going to get, or what kind of gonna, it's going to get. If you give them food one day and then water the other day, and all that, you, you drive them crazy. They just can't stop looking at the food, even if they have food next to themselves. Why? Because they can't schedule it. They don't know what's going to happen. And because we are not dealing, like we are not good at dealing with abundance, but we are trained for scarcity, what the animal is thinking, we don't know for how long we're going to be without food. So I'm just going to keep trying, and every time I get food, I will eat it. And this is exactly what we do. But uh, Skinner's uh, you know, teachings have gone to uh, Silicon Valley via uh, his hair, who is called, and even <laughs> kind of fashions himself uh, with his name and everything after Skinner, B.J. Fogg, which is the founder and director of the Behavior Design Life uh, at uh, Stanford University. And uh, because you're programmers, you know that if you want to make it big in Silicon Valley, you want to go to Stanford University. And in his class, uh, some of the most addictive designs of, of, of the, you know, of the uh, computer industry have come out of his class, like Instagram, for instance. And, uh, and uh, what he teaches are things like, you know, push notifications. This is the one thing that, uh, that the uh, gambling industry doesn't have. It doesn't have something in your pocket that is calling you like a mermaid so we can drag you uh, down the rabbit hole. And that, uh, you know, and how, you know, quantification uh, gives meaning to something that is not meaningful and how uh, the red bubbles uh, will tell you that whatever is there is important and urgent even if you don't uh, think it consciously and, you know, all this other number of things. But the thing that is most uh, incredibly addictive and genius about the addiction design in our phones is the fact that it's not gambling. And what I mean by that is that gambling industry has gambling laws, no? Like, there is a number of things you cannot do with the game while someone is playing at the game, even though you technically can. You cannot change the game in the middle just because you know who's playing just because the game is going in a certain way and you want to change it so the person that is about to leave doesn't leave, for instance, which you could do, but it's illegal. But you don't have that kind of regulations with the, uh, with the technology industry. And the thing that I like the most and that, I, <laughs> that, I, that I'm more horrified about is that this industry has convinced all of us that we're not addicted to the machine, that we're addicted to the content that we are not addicted to the device or to the applications, that we are addicted to the things that they bring us. Like, I'm addicted to work, I'm addicted to the news, I'm addicted to, uh, you know, to my health, I just need to put everything I eat and every, every step I, I make and everything I drink and every person I meet in the diary so I know that I'm doing it right, no? And yet, if you go on the bus or on the metro, and you see people on their phones, and you can see like, you know, 50-year-old men and 16-year-old uh, girls and like even kids, you know, with their, with their mom's phones. And they are obviously looking at different content, yet they are all doing the same things. Because they are not addicted to the content. The content is irrelevant. What they are addicted to is the machine. You're not addicted to the content, you're not addicted to the game. What you're addicted to is the actual slot machine. You're physically addicted to it. And the thing is, while you're in the rabbit hole, while you're in the zone, things happen. 
while you're in the zone and you're alone because it's isolating and there is like continuity, so there's no up and down, there's no right or left, there's no beginning or end, and you don't know, uh, like you don't have a sense of purpose because you don't know when the, you know, it's not a book that you can finish at some point, you don't, you don't see the end of it. While you're in the zone, you are not addicted to the content, but you are extremely receptive to it which means that you don't know what you are being fed, but you can easily be channeled uh, with information, uh, and you will not actually be conscious of most of the things that you are uh, like swallowing, in a way. So uh, there is this book that I really like. It's called uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. And one of the things that, they, that, that he does, very successfully, I think, is compare Brave New World uh, by Aldous Huxley to George Orwell's 1984. And um, he claims that Huxley was uh, actually uh, right when he was saying that the kind of authoritarian state that we should fear was not the Stalinist uh, uh, kind of a state that 1984 was describing. Because while Orwell, Orwell was describing the kind of uh, imposition or uh, manufacturing of consent through violence uh, that we had seen in the past, in the 20th century, the kind of thing that Huxley was concerned about was the manufacturing of consent through other means, through the means of mass media. And it's um, interesting um, because the book was already, in the 90s, was already uh, a very, very interesting book to read, but it was talking about TV. And as I said before, if you go in on TV to make a campaign, you have to talk to everybody with one message. But if you go in on Facebook and you pick segmented uh, uh, campa uh, campaigning, you can tell people different things at the same time and make them all think that they are listening to the same message. And we are all trained uh, by history to fear a very particular kind of totalitarian state, but we are very untrained to fear uh, the kind of consent manufacturing that, uh, that keep us uh, entertained while other important things happen. So, solutions uh, in the go. Uh, Tristan Harris, which is uh, something I don't trust so much because he comes from uh, he comes from BJ Fox uh, Laboratory, uh, just like Instagram. He founded the Center of Human. Uh, he was the uh, ethicist, if there is such a thing, in Google uh, for three for three years, and um, and he came to the conclusion that the uh, technology that is being deployed on humans uh, by the millions is not particularly ethic. So he made the Center for Human Technology, and what he's pushing for is uh, regulation. And as I said, uh, addictive industries always will tell you that the addiction is in you, not in the device. So uh, that's obviously like their strategy to avoid regulation altogether, uh, which is, has been a very successful one so far. So uh, what he's doing, apart from, um, I think, uh, very useless apps, is uh, trying to push for a regulation that is not uh, from the industry, but from the actual uh, government, which I think uh, is very, very good idea. And, uh, but the thing that I like the most is this design by, um, by I don't remember his name, but um, there is a German designer that has made this phone that makes it very, very clear that your addiction to the phone is actually physical, that you're not being addicted to, you're not a workaholic, you're just addicted to the, uh, to the thing. So uh, he has made different models of phones that would allow for you to just like get your methadone, uh, you know, with different fashions, like depending what you're more uh, particularly interested in. And, uh, and, uh, and just keep doing that. He calls it the uh, substitute phone. Uh, and, you know, I have one. <laughs> and uh, my choice of, uh, of, of trying to sneak out of, of the zone uh, is to make my relationship with my phone very uncomfortable. So I have a Pixel phone. And uh, before that, and I have that one because someone gave me an Nexus uh, some, I don't know, like five years ago and I loved it. It was the first phone that I ever loved in my entire life. It was just made for me, it was so good. And then I had the Nexus 5X, which was not so good, but still I liked it. And then the next phone that was in the market for me was this Pixel phone. And the thing that, does this, that this phone does, that I, it was the first thing I noticed uh, that the previous one didn't do, is that it wants my fingerprint. 
And I'm not stupid. Like, I know it has my fingerprint. Like, I put my fingerprint on my phone all the time. So I'm pretty sure everybody has my fingerprint right now. But if you use the fingerprint to unlock your phone, you are giving them permission to use it, which is a different problem altogether. So I decided not to do it because I don't like, uh, you know, uh, biometric uh, uh, locking and unlocking of, of things. Uh, and I try to just keep using my four pin number like I always did. And it used to offer me like a very big number um, number keyboard. And now what it offers me is this. And I have to type like in that, those tiny, tiny little shitty numbers like pretty much five times before I can actually access my phone every time. And the reason is because they are trying to make it really, really uncomfortable for me to keep doing what I was doing before. This is not a design flaw. It is a feature. <laughs> it's trying to take me to where I want, to where I don't want to go. So I have, after this happened, I started to basically try to make my life very uncomfortable through my phone. Like you know, slot machines used to used to be in like you know ugly corners of the casinos before they became like the big money maker. When they became like basically personal computers with this um, you know silly interface on the front, and they didn't even have seats. And now the casino industry buys the best seats in the world uh, for people to sit there for 48 hours in a row. And, uh, and so everything that is comfortable, like coming from my phone right now, I know this is not in the right place to preach this, but, um, but I find very, very uh, suspicious. So what I do is like, you know, I offer this resistance and uh, I have decided to not... Um, to not log in my uh, my user and my uh, and my password and in pretty much any any um, application, so I can know how it. Like for instance, I use Twitter a lot. I'm a I'm, I'm a journalist. So what I do is I don't have the Twitter application, and then I have to log in every time in the website application for the phone. And man, the things it does to you. <laughs> like you know, you cannot pretty much do anything. Like they really want you to have the app. Well, things like Ryanair. Like Ryanair would charge you like what, like 60 bucks for uh, printing your ticket? Which I'm pretty sure it's illegal, but they still do it. And so the only option that you have if you're traveling and you don't have like a, like a printer with you uh, is to use their, their application. And they tell you every time, print your ticket, we're gonna charge you like 60 quid. And uh, but just like, you know, download the application. What's, you know, what's wrong with you? And I never do. And I always try to convince the uh, people at the desk uh, to let me in without the paper and without the application. And I'm finding it like re very rewarding every time I do. And um, and so my um, my my. Uh, yeah, my, my option for resistance has been resisting the kind of applications that you guys are trying to make irresistible. So um, before I finish my talk, I would like to recommend um, these three books that are, I think, a very good companion for anyone that is concerned about the effects of, uh, of mass uh, manipulation through uh, technology uh, devices. Uh, Addiction by Design is the book that Professor Scholl uh, wrote about um, slot machines, and it's a like, really amazing read. Amusing Ourselves to Death is the one that talks about TV as this mass manipulation machine, but uh, as it happens, uh, it, it becomes like such a fundamental guide for, um, for, you know, for the, the moment that we are living uh, right now. And, and you know, we're in Spain, even though I'm speaking in English, and, um, and you know, we have a lot of elections coming. And I don't know you, but I'm totally terrified by the kind of like, campaigns that we're gonna have uh, in the next uh, few months, especially after uh, Brazil's elections uh, pro have, have proven to be like a guideline for pretty much the worst instincts in the political sphere, which is saying a lot. And then Emerson is always good to read. So um, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here.